Hello and welcome back to the Hypothesis episode 54. Today we have our special guest, Edward, today. So my name is Feely. I'm Leo. I'm Edward. So, very special guest today. Um, I think we have a few guests lately, which is really nice. And so, this one, we will be talking in nuclear physics. So, Edward will begin his PhD in plasma physics and fusion energy at Durham University in the UK. And he'll be investiga- investigating real-time control of plasma instabilities and fast ion physics. So... Edward currently has a master in applied science in physics from Queen's University, where I'm currently at, and he researched in plasma physics and nuclear fusion. But and he also worked in an experimental magnetic fusion research lab for the six month in Japan on collisional merging confinement. So, and he did his bachelor in electrical engineering from Western University, so, and he did in. Control theory, computer science, electronics, and signal processing. I think he might be the first engineer on the show, if I remember correctly. I'm not sure, Liam. What do you think? Uh, I can check, but I don't remember off the top of my head. And um, I heard a control engineer is a little. Oh, it's it's a it's a very difficult topic. <laughs> uh, one thing we should mention too is that Patrick is not here. Because he has a job, and he had to go do that job last second. Um, he had to go out in the field and do some research. So he he's not here, unfortunately, but you know he's with us in spirit. And using the magic of video, or I guess audio editing, we're gonna he's gonna tell a story at the end of this episode, even though he's not here. Um, so look forward to that. All right. So we're gonna move on to the. Intro topic, I think, which Liam prepared in plasma physics, which I'd like to hear Edward's um, perspective on it. Because we are, I think we are both, that we, Liam and I, we don't know much at all about plasma physics. We know it exists, <laughs> the extent of that. Yeah, so Edward, um, correct me if I'm wrong or butt in or whatever you want to do, because again, I know a little bit about plasmas, but not that much and this so this was some paper that i um found that i'm going to talk about so this paper was titled characterization of quasi quasi keplerian differentially rotating free boundary layer plasmas which is quite a mouthful um it was published in physical review letters on may 12th 2023 and the short version of the title is that the researchers who published this paper described how they were able to create a spinning disk of plasma. So imagine like a a CD, like a 2D disk of plasma. Um, And it's spinning and it mimics the physics of the accretion disks, which can actually form around black holes or stars. Uh, So in other words, they're able to rotate some plasma in such a way that the mathematics describing it is equivalent in some regime to the physics that describes accretion disks of rotating matter which can be found around certain stars or black holes well i think first we should explain a bit of what a plasma is in my humble uh, knowledge is that plasma is just ionized gas is it not just like you know, um, particles that are free of the valence electrons or you know have well ionized or have enough energy to become ionized and high energy. Is that it, or is there a more extended definition of plasma, Edward? Well, there's uh, usually an accepted definition that most people quote verbatim. Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember exactly, but usually people say plasma is just a collection of charged particles that display a long term long-range collective effect. Yeah, basically what that means is if you just have um, some ions close together, it's not necessarily going to constitute a plasma. There's certain conditions that need to be satisfied uh, on the ionized gas to 
uh, constitute a plasma, you know, things like number of charges within a certain uh, volume, things like uh, collision frequency, uh, all these conditions need to be satisfied to uh, appropriately uh, call something a plasma. But still, uh, there's a wide range of conditions that, or there's a wide range of examples of plasmas in nature and uh, artificially made um, through, and it spans a very uh, rich parameter space in terms of density and uh, temperatures. Like fire is a plasma, right? Like is like flame, sorry, not exactly fire. Um, uh, what, what else? I think what Liam said about what's so special about plasma, why, why this state of matter is so interesting, and even like that behavior of well, equivalent to or similar to accretion disk, like what's special? What, why plasma? Why not just fluids or gas that could possibly have the same effect? Well, I, I think you said that, Edward, or like uh, Feely, I think Edward already said that, is that you get these long range interactions in a plasma. So all the particles, maybe I'm wrong, but um, when I think of a plasma, I think of something that's heated to high temperatures. Um, maybe, like you said, Edward, that you can have different um, parameter spaces. You can make, I don't know if you can make a low temperature plasma or not. Maybe you can, but. I typically think of like high temperatures. You like you take some gas and you raise its temperature so it ionizes. You get these charged particles that are moving around, um, quote unquote, freely. Um, but on top of the regular interaction, so if you imagine like these particles whizzing around, they have close, short range kind of like contact interactions where they bounce around off each other. But in the plas, because it's a plasma on top of that, you get like longer range interactions. Um, where they can affect each other from further away, right? Well, so all charged particles interact uh, via the uh, Lorentz force, right? So um, in a plasma, however, the electrostatic force is actually screened, uh, which means that the range at which uh, charges can interact via the electric field a static electric field is is much shorter than what you would have in, in the case of just say two elementary particles together um what what is quite interesting regarding uh the long range effects of uh the magnetic field on plasma is that the plasma behaves like a fluid that responds to the magnetic field so as the fluid moves, the magnetic field shape or topology or structure also moves with the plasma. So you can introduce a magnetic field to shape or control uh, plasmas, which is in, which is uh, why why they're so interesting. Okay, so they're still short range interactions, but they're just much much shorter than typical. And then you also have these long range interactions. Did I get yeah. that right? Yes, yeah, okay. due to the due to the magnetic field. Is that is that the magnetic field in the plasma, or is that like a separate applied one outside? So both. So you can apply external magnetic fields, and also the charged particles move and then create their own magnetic field. And there's some very uh, interesting uh, configurations of self-generated magnetic fields that act to keep the plasma together essentially okay okay it's so interesting you say that because it's controllable by a magnetic field that helps a lot in terms of like instead of a fluid you need to stir it right like normally it's like it's really in a way it's harder to control but if you can apply magnetic field like homogeneous magnetic field you can basically make the whole thing move homogeneously hopefully and maybe that's why you can control to create this kind of accretion disk, like to simulate what around the black hole. Well, the internal scale might be some some issues there uh, to figure out. Yeah, but I mean, it probably depends on a bunch of things, how the magnetic field affects different parts of the plasma, like if the edges of the plasma are less dense or stuff like that. But um, yeah, I think that's exactly so. Coming back to this paper, I I study a field called analog gravity 
um, where I, I do the theory part of it, not the experimental part. So um, where people basically, they study real world things you can make in a lab made out of fluids or ultra cold gases or whatever. Um, and they create systems that mimic black holes or the inflation of the universe or stars or other things. Um, but usually when they do this, they're, they're doing it because we don't have a full theory of quantum gravity and they want something that you can create in a lab and experiment on, which is mathematically equivalent to say like a black hole or something. Um, because you know, you can't actually experiment on black holes, unfortunately, and we probably will never be able to, at least within our lifetime. So that's, that's what I study. And, but this was, this paper was the first instance I've seen of a system which mimicked an accretion disk because usually they want to study quantum gravitational things but um an accretion disk is you don't need quantum gravity to describe it as far as i know and i think the reason why they used a plasma so well i guess what is an accretion disk first for maybe for some people who don't know um yeah so so it's this for stars and black holes these massive bodies in space um what happens is that if there's matter around them, what can happen is that this 2D circular disk shape forms around them, created of diffuse matter, um, and various electromagnetic and gravitational forces between the matter particles and this massive object like the star or black hole. They'll cause instabilities in this orbiting material and it will spiral inwards towards the central body. And as it accelerates and due to gravitational and frictional forces, what happens is that all this matter gets compressed, it raises the temperature, and as the matter, matter spirals, it actually emits electromagnetic radiation, so light. Um, for example, if you ever watch the movie Interstellar, you see this giant bright shape around the black hole in the movie. That's the accretion disk and all the light being emitted from it. And the first image of a black hole that was ever taken by the Event Horizon Telescope, that blurry orange blob that you might have seen, which we've talked about before, that's the light emitted from the accretion disk. We didn't actually see the black hole, we just saw the effects of it through the accretion disk. Um, so I think the reason why they, they so they create this system in a lab, because like you said, you can fire magnetic fields into a plasma and you can control it, you can make it rotate, you can wrap it around some central point, and I don't know the details, but the experimentalists are very good at what they do. Um, and I think it's because plasmas have both short and long range interactions, which is why they use the plasma to mimic an accretion disk. Because for a gravitational accretion disk, you have short range electromagnetic interactions between the bits of matter, and then you have longer gravitational interactions between the matter um, itself and between the matter and the black hole or the star that it's orbiting around. So I think that's the, why they had to use plasma in order to mimic an accretion disk, and they couldn't just use some other state of matter. Uh, so you can use kind of magnetic field instead of gravity, right? Because I think most of the forces are governed by the inverse square. Uh, like it's it's um, the the a magnitude of force goes down by one over r square or one over distance square. Gravity, magnetic field, electric field. But to how do you apply that, right? Like the fact that magnetic field can be controlled quite, and let's say easy, much easier than gravity. So you can probably mimic that in a lab better. And if you can find the same, uh, or like you can tune magnetic field so it has the relative strength, like a stars and planets or a mass around black holes. I, I don't see why, why it's not possible. Yeah, I, I don't know what the long range interactions in a plasma look like. I don't know if they're one over R squared, but maybe there's some way to tune them so they are, I don't know. Well, it should, right? Is it not? If it's governed by magnetic field, it should behave like, you know, ma magnetic material. Yeah, I know in ultra cold gases, you can get long range interactions, um, and they're one over r cubed interactions, so not quite r squared, but in a plasma, it might be different. Anyway, I just thought it was neat that plasmas has, have now entered my field of analog gravity in a different way, but some something related that I thought was neat. Um, yeah, one way, one way of modeling a plasma is just as a dielectric medium. Oh, okay, okay. So all the conventional uh, equations apply. Hmm. 
Was well, is that an approximation or like how does it fundamentally behave like a dielectric medium? As far as I know, it's fundamental. Hmm. Interesting. I haven't haven't done like electromagnetic stuff for quite a while. I was trying to remember. <laughs> yeah, I know. We uh been a long time. So I think we can move on to the main topic of Edward. So as you I have mentioned before that Edward's that did work in both plasma and fusion. They might, I think, they might be quite close. So, Edward, so have you been working in a research lab in terms of fusion? Um, I thought, or I think, fusion reactor and stuff is not possible now, right? Like, uh, there is some breakthrough. I think a while back, I heard about like they get like a net gain out of fusion reaction, and is that what you were? working on or like what what is the industry working on in terms of fusion when we hear fusion it to me it still feels like a dream it's like still far is it far or is it like where are we right now in terms of human endeavor well there's a lot involved uh with answering that question and uh, i just want to say that i appreciate the introduction being about astrophysical plasmas because it really touches on the point that plasmas are found all throughout the universe and um, they, there's there's so many different uh, ways of studying them and reasons to study them and the reason I'm studying them is for nuclear fusion as you mentioned so that's my motivation in uh, in learning more about them and advancing our knowledge. And to, you know, address energy problems uh, in the world and, uh, and greenhouse gas emissions from conventional sources of electricity like oil and natural gas. So uh, that, that's my motivation. And, you know, I do have an engineering background. So perhaps I'm not that typical guest very well versed in the machinery of physics and and theoretical physics especially but yeah i'm happy to uh talk about uh fusion and that application of plasma physics so yeah fusion is uh has been or controlled nuclear fusion to be specific for energy has been of in- of great interest uh, since the 50s. And there's been a lot of successes and failures throughout the years. And there's so many dif- different approaches, right? So a lot of the uh, work that has been undertaken in the past is culminating uh, right now uh, with the ITER project, I-T-E-R, ITER in, Fran- in, in French where it's being constructed in France, and it's a colossal uh, toroidal confinement chamber called a tokamak, which is a Russian acronym. And um, it's a really an amazing uh, engineering project. So many scientists, many decades of work has been put in to understand the fundamental physics of toroidal plasma confinement in a tokamak. And uh, the international community is very confident that if we can construct ITER to its specifications, we will uh, have um, approximately a gain of five. For a fusion reactor, right? Yes. Like five? What do you mean, like 5%? Five percent? Or... Five times. Five times. Five times. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Five times. So. My my next question is that you mentioned a bit like what has plasma has anything to do with fusion because in my uh, understanding fusion is like let's say put two hydrogens together and you get helium you know like and energies come out and it's like what 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 has plasma has anything to do with nuclear fusion? Well, Liam mentioned uh, earlier that when he thinks of plasma, he thinks of high temperature. And it's funny because even what we consider low temperature plasmas, which is a very interesting field in it of itself, they're above a thousand degrees Kelvin. So everything is technic- 
you know, like to us, and a matter of fact, like it's hot, but it's not extremely hot where for like in the case of uh, nuclear fusion. So in order to ionize gas, uh, you need to supply heat or energy to raise the average energy above the threshold ionization potential, which for hydrogen, I believe it's like around 13 EV. And in Kelvin, I think it's around 10,000. So that's why things are hot. That's why things are plasma in a in nuclear fusion, because um, in order to get particles to fuse or to get ions to fuse, rather, you need to have them moving very, very fast, which means that their temperature is extremely hot. And at that temperature, they're ionized. Right. And I think one of the reasons too, because um, if you have valence electrons, you have like this elect electromagnetic shielding, right? So if you strip up all electrons, let's say, because um, I think the number you see a lot in high school or whatever, right? Like, oh, hydrogen atom has a ionization energy of 13.6 electron volts or negative 13.6 electron volt. And without that electron electronic shielding, then you just have nucleus left. And, and without those shielding, you can, well, it might be easier to try to fuse those atoms without electrons, rather try to fuse something with have like many electrons rather shield from fusing. So it might be, would be why <laughs> the fusion requires these kind of ions. But you also mentioned before that not all um, uh, ionized gas are plasma. So when you get to that high temperature for fusion, so they do they actually form plasma instead of just ionized gas? Oh, certainly. Uh, the distinction between ionized gas and plasma is it's not too great, but uh, yes, uh, for in fusion, uh, the gas is sufficiently hot and dense to constitute a plasma. And you said that, what they're trying to build is a toroidal, so it's like a donut, right? Like, are they putting like a magnetic field so they get a pat? I don't know what they're trying to do. Are they trying to spin the plasma in, in this tube, or, or like, how does that mechanism work, if you know? Right. So, um, in the case of ITER with the tokamak, there's, um, or there's um, two sets of, there are several sets of uh, magnetic field coils which introduce a toroidal magnetic field and a poloidal magnetic field. So we have uh, magnetic field coils creating a magnetic field along the torus and then around the torus, which act to uh, keep the plasma from touching the walls, essentially. And all that we're looking to do is to keep that really, really hot gas, which is a plasma, from touching the walls for long enough in order to uh, have enough fusion reactions to occur that, are, it, that will be enough uh, energy. Right. Because if it's really hot, I think the pro one of the problems that come with nuclear reactor, nuclear fusion, is that any container would just melt. Right? It's like nothing can contain it. So I what they're trying to solve is basically try to use a magnetic field to basically contain it, make it float and not touch the wall. Yeah, right. And and this is just one example of a particular type of magnetic confinement. And there's a whole other branch of fusion called um, inertial confinement, where in, in, instead of taking like a uh, moderately dense plasma to really high temperatures, you're going to create a, you're going to focus energy on a plasma, which is much more dense at a lower temperature. And that will essentially create the same conditions for fusion, just on the other end of the spectrum, where um, the number of fusion reactions that occur are proportional to density and temperature. So you can either have really, really dense and lower temperature, or you can have lower, t lower density and a higher temperature. So there's a trade-off there, and it's very interesting to see 
the different types of devices that exploit uh, the different regimes. So where does where does your work come into this? Because um, you're working on plasma instabilities and fast ion physics. So how does how does this come in to the equation? So uh, I'm not working on it yet. Uh, oh, slated... that's what you will work on. Yes, and okay. um, I'm very happy to find myself here because uh, the particular um, device, the experimental device, and on which I'll be taking measurements, is one that I deem to hold a g- great potential. That being the spherical tokamak. So one of the major differences between a spherical tokamak and a uh, conventional tokamak like theater is you can make the machine a lot smaller, but because the machine's a lot smaller, there's less uh, plasma in it. So there's going to be less uh, fusion reactions in in the ball. So uh, in order to get around this smaller plasma volume, uh, we can do things like increase the magnetic field. And that's a very interesting uh, topic of research and activity in the private sector, where the introduction of novel high temperature superconducting magnets are being introduced. And there's companies uh, like Spark in the US and Tokamak Energy in UK, which are both pursuing a spherical tokamaks with high temperature superconductors. Well, I think we just talked, I think it was previous episode on superconductors. Good timing. Yeah, it's it's interesting because like you need large magnetic field to control fusion or or at least you know, try to control fusion, and to achieve that, usually you have to have some kind of superconductors to have large magnetic field, and with that come with the cooling that also use energy. So you're saying with the tokamak thing, even with all the cost of cooling, superconducting, and stuff, you still that have that gain of five, which is really huge. But my question is on maybe on the engineering perspective of the fusion reactor or like the fusion energy, because to me all because if you're gonna use to generate electricity, it has to go through some kind of turbine and stuff. So in this type of fusion reactor, how do you translate or transform the energy from the heat from the? I'm I'm guessing the heat comes out of the fusion into the electricity or energy that we use. Is that some, do they just use that to boil water and to power a turbine? Or is it like a, a special way to take tr- and transform that fusion energy? That's another great question. And uh, there's two uh, methods that are generally discussed. Uh, one of them is, cons- is much harder to devise a practical strategy to do so. But the primary method that is most likely to be adopted by first first generation fusion devices is just neutron heating of some blanket material, which will transfer that heat to water. And that water will uh, turn to gas, turn to steam, and spin a turbine. The other method is... um, called direct energy conversion. So because we have a plasma, we can exploit the flow of charged particles and we can induce electricity in a nearby conductor um, instead of, and and there's great benefits from that, meaning we don't have to, um, there's so many, we don't have to deal with so many inefficiencies related to boiling water and turning a turbine we can extract uh, the energy of the charged particle motion uh, directly. Oh, right. It's like putting through like a charge particle through solid noise and that magnetic field would generate electric field and current. That's really smart way to do it. Yeah. Saves a lot of water too. But also, yeah, it's it's inter. I just saw this kind of cool how we talked about superconductors last episode. And it's funny how like there's an already like a really important application that we missed coming up. That's kind of neat. Um, mm-hmm. 
yeah so that that's that's very important work as far as i'm concerned way more important than what i do um but for the sake of time we should maybe talk about your path unless feely has something he wants to say first well, I think we. Sh I th want to emphasize emphasize why we uh, kind of want nuclear fusion because normal fission reactor. What well, the problem with fission reactors is that we have radioactive waste, so we have these like unstable materials we use for nuclear fission, and then what comes out of it is still radioactive. But fusion, you start from let's say hydrogen, right, which is a like, normal hydrogen, or maybe just ionized hydrogen or deuterium or material, and then you fuse them, and what comes out is just normal helium or more this is in terms of toxic waste is much much better for uh, in terms of toxic waste management am i right yes exactly in terms of radioactive waste um fusion is much safer than uh, fission so the word nuclear gets a bad reputation um because of a few different accidents that have occurred uh, with fission reactors. And the reason why fission reactors can be dangerous, that doesn't mean our technology is dangerous, but the reaction itself is undergoes a, a chain reaction. So fission starts from a heavy nuclei, like uranium, that's unstable. And so it's emitting, so when it gets hit with a, uh, a neutron, it ejects a neutron, and that neutron will hit another uh, uranium atom, and that'll eject another neutron. And it's very difficult, if not impossible, I believe, to, to stop that. So once you start the reaction in a fission uh, reactor, it's going to keep going. So in the case of fusion, it's much different. You start with the light. Uh, nuclei like hydrogen uh, we're also investigating or isotopes of hydrogen rather like deuterium tritium and and it's important to point out that deuterium can be found in trace uh, amounts in ocean water or seawater they, they say using uh, deuterium as a fuel is great because it's abundant and and it's 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 much well, it's inherently more stable than uranium. And the byproduct is, is helium and a neutron in the case of the uh, deuterium and tritium uh, fusion reaction. So uh, not only is the fuel uh, more stable than uh, fission, but the reaction itself does not have the same problems related to the chain reaction and the issue of, of of a meltdown. That sounds great, actually. So I want to get into your background a bit. So what really got in, you into plasma and nuclear physics, really? Like, was it when you... Because you had an engineering degree, right? And, and it was three control engineering is completely different uh, than plasma physics. And uh, m maybe it's not so much. Who knows? So I want to hear, like, what got you into the plasma physics and nuclear technology? Yeah, it's uh, funny. Funny the, when I first learned about um, fusion, exactly it was I was watching a sh sh two uh, season uh, television series called Physics of the Impossible or Sci Fi Physics. I forget the exact name, but it was by the famous uh, science popularizer Michio Kaku. Michio Kaku, yeah. Who is a, yeah, exactly. We, we all, we're all familiar with him. And uh, so in a show, which I highly recommend anyone watch, it's really uh, wonderful. And he discusses sci-fi technology, so things you might see in Star Trek that, you know, don't exist today or may not ever exist. But he thinks of ways that we could make it a reality. And he interviews real scientists. Uh, about their research and how it may impact the future of technology and these sci-fi projects. And what in, what got what got my attention the most was the requirement for energy stored. In order to do anything, uh, we need energy. 
and we needed a lot of it to do a lot of these uh, monument to, to make a lot of these technologies come to light. So quite often he would talk about fusion as the solution. And he would talk about, he, and then he would go to different laboratories, different, have different interviews. And in particular, the National Ignition Facility in the US, where they just recently released a uh, statement regarding uh, break even or a net gain of energy from, from, their, uh, from their experiment. So things that you discussed then are, are progressing. And I think that's what's exciting about um, this field is that we always say that fusion is going to take a while or it's not here yet, but things are progressing and it's very measurable. So that, that's exciting. Uh, we can push the ball forward and we have a very well-defined goal and there's different challenges along the way. Uh, mostly engineering challenges, but there's still certainly a lot of interesting physics to uh, to learn. So, so that show got you into interest in nuclear and new fusion technology. So, that move from engineering to mass in physics, or was uh, was it difficult to make that change from engineering to more like theoretical um, part, or, or maybe you do bunch of experimental stuff. What was it like to move from engineering to more like a science-y feel? Well, I took a dual degree in undergrad. So I did an extra year where I took nothing but physics courses. So that definitely helped a lot. And um, upon thinking about grad school, um, you know, I thought to myself, I think that physics would be more intellectual then uh, postgrad degree in engineering. Uh, so, so that's why I, I decided to choose it. Mm -hmm. Because I know there's like nuclear engineering too, right? Is that different or like it's the same? Yeah, it's more applied, I'd say. And uh, looking at uh, materials is an important uh, topic in nuclear engineering. Yeah, but I, I wanted to, uh, to, to uh, research uh, topics that were more fundamental in nature to to and so so that's why I pursue a graduate degree in physics. So I want to walk you down more uh, deeper in the memory lane a little bit. So I find that everybody's uh, story when they, how they get involved to science is is always unique and fascinating. So you know since you were young or like you know even though like maybe high school like what got you interested in science like or even engineering in general like you know you know everyone is a kid at some point right like and we just go play around run around and some some of us like science but what what sparks that um interest in you in terms of science and engineering well i might be uh sort of unique uh, in that sense, because um, I didn't have much interest in it until late in high school. I was actually working for a carpenter, and he was trying to talk to me about using mechanical advantage, using levers and whatnot, and I didn't know what he was talking about. So I really knew at that point I needed to uh, take more courses at high school and learn all I could about uh, science and engineering. And I did that. And then I came across that documentary, as I, as I just mentioned, and then, and then I got excited about the future and, and, and how we can uh, and, how, and how I can contribute to that. Mm -hmm. Were you like uh, good at math growing up, or was it something that you don't think about or didn't think about? Well, I do recall uh, a teacher of mine saying I was good at math, but I don't remember trying or or like being involved with like a math competition or things like that. But yeah, certainly, I believe that I it did have some math ability. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So you approach science from more like a practical perspective, right? You you were doing some work, and oh, here's the thing you need to know, and 
it happened you're good at it and you're really interested in it so you pursued engineering and now fusion huh very interesting exactly. and so, oh interest of time a little bit so i want to uh talk this is the routine question a loaded question that I'll, i'll ask every single guest so it's about your hopes and dreams so not exactly about how you see yourself in 10 years or but But in terms of the future, where do you see yourself? You see yourself being a fusion engineer, a teacher. What type of um, career or life you want to lead in the future? You know, you have any idea? I know it's a loaded question, but you know, have you thought about that or have some plans? I'd say I'm open to uh, different uh, possibilities. Um, I love. I I do love teaching. So I would definitely consider that, and also I, I I want to make a real impact on technology. So whether that mean working for a company or the government, or or creating a business as a startup fusion company, there's so many of those these days. All of those uh, career paths would would be exciting. So. Do you see fusion um, technology or fusion reactors like possible or plausible in our lifetime? We will see one in our lifetime. You think it's our children generation that would live on fusion energy? I I think it's possible in our lifetime. Mm-hmm. I think so too. Yeah, definitely, and and I even think, um, well, companies in different groups are doing uh, are creating fusion. Uh, It's making fusion happen every day. Uh, you know, they're creating 100 million degrees Celsius plasmas, and they're getting energy out of it in terms of uh, neutron energy and collecting that in various ways. But uh, whether it's economical on a large scale for powering cities is a different question. Um, the goal, the target reactor size. Um, For most of these startup, young startup companies, is about 100 megawatts. Going up to you know a gigawatt is kind of like the largest you could ever conceive at, the, at, at current technology readiness levels. Um, but yeah, I think certainly even within the next decade, uh, there'll there'll be some uh, small scale commercial. Um, Fusion reactors uh, being so uh, like whose energy is being sold, and hopefully you be part of the team, <laughs> uh, leading the new energy world. <laughs> That's so cool that it's it's so close and it's such a better option than fission reactors because like fission reactors are good at making power, but they have all these extra complications with them. So I'm a big fusion fan. Um, and what I I also think is really cool is how this plasma is. Having coming into play and how superconductors are coming in because like plasma is one of these states of matter where I mean you it's all over the universe right it's in stars um, even in our own sun we have like this proton proton chain you have fusion reactions you have plasma and you can you can create plasma in a lab just as like pr- I don't want to say easily but you know people do it all the time so it's not Not extremely difficult, um, although trying to create a fusion reactor is a whole other topic. So, I think last kind of last ish question I want to ask is more local. So, in terms of like you know we live in Canada, so in terms of Canadian fusion technology, are we part of the the I have to say race or the effort of of doing fusion technology or? Or is it more in the UK and the US? Or is there anything in Canada going on? Yeah. So um, I, I mentioned first that uh, the Easter project is an international effort. I believe at the moment there's seven uh, sign- signatory countries, some of which are the US, Europe, Japan, China, India, and so on. I forget exactly who, but. Um, Canada was a member of that organization and contributing until uh, the 90s, I believe, early 90s, and it, it was deemed not important enough 
for our investments were not immediate uh, enough for Canadian investment. Uh, so and and at the time we had two, I believe, major Tuckamack research facilities. One of which is still in operation uh, at the University of Saskatchewan. They have a small Tuckamack and several students in a very active research group, some of whom I've met. And um, so in, ter- at, in academia, that's a very active uh, group. It's very exciting research coming from them. And in terms of uh, startup companies, there are two, to my knowledge. Um, the, the most uh, famous is General Fusion in BC. They're pursuing uh, a technology called the magnetized target fusion. So it's sort of in the middle between high density and high temperatures. And their particular device is non-conventional, but it's very practical. So we have the technology to, to test their concept now. So that's why it's exciting. that's why their work is exciting. And the other uh, company um, I work for, they're a smaller company uh, in Montreal called Fuse Energy Technologies, and uh, at the time I was working on a, a Z pinch reactor prototype. So it's another unusual type of fusion concept that was researched intensively in the early pioneering years, say in the 60s, and it has seen a recent re-emergence due to a concept called shared flow stabilization. And there's a company in uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle called Zap Energy, which is uh, raising money and planning to construct a device based on the shared flow Z pinch, shared flow stabilized Z pinch uh, concept. All right. Wow, that sounds good. Well, I think in the interest of time, we have to cut it here. But thank you very much, Edward. And I will get Patrick to you know use his remote voice to tell everyone how to contact us and reach us. So if anyone have any questions or, you know, um, later on. Yeah, I'm happy if somehow uh, people reach out to me to to share anything that I can, if that helps in their career. Well, well, if anyone have questions or things to ask Edward, just let us know and uh, we, we can pass along the word to Edward. Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. I think that's the best spot. Edward Dewitt and... The name as is spelled on the episode. So, all right. So the last thing is we get the voice of Patrick to tell the story today, and that will be later. So thank you very much, Edward. Thanks, guys. It's a great discussion. Yeah. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. If you missed it uh, earlier in the episode, you will have now just discovered that I'm not there for the live recording of the episode. That's also in the show notes. Unfortunately, I had to go out to the field for work, but I'm back for the story and to tell you how to contact us. To begin, you can contact us through many different methods. Those include YouTube, Instagram, email. We'll get into all of that. But the primary way in which you can contact us is through our email. We are hyperthesispodcast at gmail.com. You can Reach out anytime if you have questions or if you too would like to be a guest on the show, very much like Edward was. Uh, We are always interested in learning about new topics in science, and if you are an expert in your field, please reach out to us. If you would also like to contact us through Instagram, uh, we do accept DMs or comments. Uh, And while you're there, you may as well follow our page and uh, give hearts or likes to our posts. Uh, We are at the Hyperthesis, you can find get updates about when we are posting episodes. We are planning a break pretty soon, so you'll find out more details then. And hopefully Liam continues posting like the occasional meme. I'm sure Oppenheimer has produced some interesting memes that we've yet to see. 
So we'll see what he posts. Otherwise, we are on YouTube. We are pretty much caught up with uh, all of our episodes. So there's well over 50 episodes on YouTube now, since we are on episode 54 currently. So go ahead, check those out. You can like, subscribe, comment. Just let us know that you're listening and uh, what topics you would also like to see. Now, if you're listening to this, obviously you use some sort of podcasting service. We are based out of Spotify, but you can find us on Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Audible, pretty much wherever you can find podcasts. And if you do have the option to, uh, please rate us or and leave a comment about what you think of our podcast. And again, if you would like to be on an episode of the Hyperthesis talking about your area of interest, please send us a message. No matter the way, we check them all, and we would be more than happy to have you. Now, you heard all about nuclear reactors and fusion and um, all of these different things to do with plasma and um, everything that's focused with Edward's research. But today we're going to be taking a step back and looking at research that happened not quite a hundred years ago, but getting there uh, within the next couple decades. And that is the topic of the first nuclear reactor. Now, while nuclear reactors are controversial nowadays, with countries like Germany decommissioning all of their reactors quite recently, actually, they are less than a hundred years old. So in terms of physics and technology, it's actually still quite new. Now, we have seen where things have gone quite wrong with nuclear reactors, and this has led to a lot of pushback, especially from the general public. However, these nuclear reactors are a lot different than the very first nuclear reactor. This first nuclear reactor was known as the Chicago Pile 1, which was developed in secret during World War II. While this was the first artificial nuclear reactor, natural nuclear processes take place constantly on Earth. Uh, I believe there's a specific cave in South Africa that's been undergoing natural fission processes where you have this chunk of uranium in the ground, particularly uranium oxide, that has been uh, sustaining itself for many thousands, tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of years. However, with these artificial nuclear processes, we haven't really known about them for too long. So the purpose of the Chicago Pile 1, or CP1 as I'll call it, was to show that chain reactions required for uranium fission could be produced artificially, and this acted as a stepping stone in the development of the atomic bomb with the Manhattan Project. Now, I wouldn't touch on the full details of the Manhattan Project in the story. That is very lengthy. Um, I have yet to see Oppenheimer, so maybe it's good that I missed the first part of this episode, but Uh, maybe go watch that. There are also great resources both online and your local libraries or wherever you may get your information, reliable information, on the Manhattan Project. However, there are many big names that were associated with the Manhattan Project that got their start kind of with CP1. Now, like its name suggests, this first reactor, the Chicago Pile 1, was first developed at the University of Chicago with its first run taking place on December 2nd, 1942. The University of Chicago was selected specifically because of its its high number of physicists and chemists while remaining centrally located in the continental United States, and it had enough space to actually build the reactor. The spot chosen to build this first reactor was beneath the stands of a football field at the university, and thankfully the football field itself hadn't been used in several years since 1939. Chicago kind of did away with football for a little bit there. Now, the basis for the development and construction of the reactor was the metal- Metallurgical Laboratory, which was run by Professor Arthur Holly Compton. And yes, it is that Compton, best known for Compton scattering, in which he won the Nobel Prize. And Compton scattering is just the scattering of a high-energy photon off of a charged particle. He is the first Nobel laureate that we'll mention, uh, and joining him were Leo Szilard, Eugene Wigner, the second Nobel Prize, and Enrico Fermi, the third Nobel Prize winner in this group of four, along with many hundreds of scientists. 
So it wasn't just these four men who were doing this. This was a whole team. And again, this was kind of a precursor to the uh, main point of the Manhattan Project. Now, before delving into the details of the reactor specifically, I just want to talk briefly about these leading scientists and why they were chosen for the CP1 project. Leo Sillard is responsible for the idea of nuclear chain reactions, which he produced in 1933. So again, this was less than 10 years before they turned the reactor on, that the idea that nuclear chain reactions could actually happen. And this was actually inspired by chemical chain reactions, where when you have two chemicals mixing, they might produce some sort of uh, additional chemical that then goes on to have its own reaction. And these chain reactions were first theorized to happen in nuclear physics by Sillard, uh, who thought that neutrons that were released in a reaction could then go on to cause other reactions. Um, now, he actually patented the first nuclear reactor using this idea, uh, thinking that these uh, isotopes could release a lot of energy that could be useful for something. So, Sillard really came up with the idea of the nuclear reactor and patented it, so it's pretty official. Um, mind you, it's not the nuclear reactors we have today, but it's still very interesting nonetheless. Now, nuclear fission itself was actually later discovered, so he didn't know nuclear fission could really occur in this sense at the time, but it was discovered in 1938 by Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, who were two German chemists. Once discovered, Enrico Fermi uh, took these ideas of fission and worked with an extensive group of collaborators whose names you would also recognize, but there's quite a few. Uh, and he worked with them to conduct experiments in nuclear fission in early 1939. Sillard, who was working at Columbia, Columbia University in the United States at the time, also did experiments involving fission, proving that a chain reaction would be possible. Wigner was a theoretical physicist who worked on uh, theory relating to the atomic nucleus and elementary particles. So he was theoretical instead of more so experimental. And, and that's where he comes into it, was he was able to develop a lot of theory behind what was going on. And he was also responsible for the design of a nuclear reactor that would convert uranium into plutonium, which would then be used in atomic weapons. Now, there are many other people involved in this project, along with several other big names. Uh, but there is just one that I want to mention, or else this story would go on for far too long, and that person is Leona Woods, a physicist who at the age of 23 was the only female member of the team involved with CP1. She was instrumental in the development of instruments and construction of the Geiger counters that were used for analysis during the experiment. So these Geiger counters were very important to determine what kind of activity was going on within the nuclear reactor. She also went on to help with the first atomic bomb, and being one of the few women to actually do so. Uh, unfortunately, um, but we will digress from that point for now. Now, given that this was a portion of the early Manhattan Project, the construction of the reactor was kept quiet, even from officials in Chicago and at the University of Chicago. So the president of the university didn't know what was going on even. And it was kind of, We'll just do it because that's what we need to be doing in accordance with the war effort and the American government. Now, the initial construction required pure graphite bricks, which is something that had not really been produced. These graphite bricks were excellent for these nuclear reactors as they had the right interaction with neutrons that actually allowed these reactions to happen. Now, the involvement of Herbert G. McPherson and Victor C. Hamister was required as they knew a lot about carbon, including what impurities might impede its neutron capturing ability. The main impurity was boron, so McPherson, Hamister, and Lachlan Curry designed a purification method of graphite, which was then used as a neutron moderator. Now, by 1942, 231 metric tons had been shipped to the University of Chicago. Which, to produce pure graphite, that's quite a bit, especially when the process had just, just been discovered. The final ingredient for the assembly of the reactor was uranium. And in particular, uranium-235, which is a less stable isotope of uranium. Alfred O.C. Neer 
was able to do just this, providing the first purified sample of uranium-235, which he sent by mail. Because, again, the impacts of radioactivity on the human body were not quite understood at that time, especially as well as we know today. Now, before CP-1 was constructed, a smaller test reactor was made to ensure the components would operate as expected, uh, and the hopes that it would become critical, or having a k-value greater than 1. These piles, as Fermi called them, in reference to the fact that they looked just like a heap, um, were essentially miniature nuclear reactors, and the first was built in 1941 and consisted of 288 tincotic cans, iron cans, filled with uranium oxide, each surrounded completely by graphite. So they would stack in a certain pattern these bricks of graphite and these cans uh, to try and make them still uh, reactive with each other and produce these fission chain reactions while also being safe about it and not letting a runaway reaction occur. These cans were actually assembled by the university football team, who could move the 67 kilogram cans with ease. And these cans were about 20 by 20 by 20 centimeters and just filled with uranium oxide. And finally, a radium beryllium neutron source was used, but the reaction did not occur and it, the reactor did not become critical. Other smaller test reactors were constructed, but they really weren't enough. So there began the construction of CP1 in November of 1942, with the first layer being a large rubber square balloon to encase the reactor and allow the air inside to be replaced with carbon dioxide, something that would be a bit more inert. This 7.6 meter sided balloon unfurled on one side, which allowed for the construction of the reactor within. The reactor itself was assembled methodically using graphite blocks and uranium box in specified patterns. This reactor was intended to be spherical, or at least as close to spherical as you can get with blocks, to achieve the optimal results, which minimizes the surface area while maximizing the volume. 45,000 blocks of graphite and 19,000 pieces of uranium were used, all having been machined on site, which is a hazard in of itself. Cadmium was used for the control rod material, which is able to absorb neutrons and damp the reaction when needed because other than that, the reaction would just become too much and essentially go, well, go nuclear and melt down. Um, there also need to be neutron sensors and other sensors that were being developed specifically for the project, which were placed near the bottom. Due to a higher purity uranium and better than expected graphite that were produced as the reactor was being built, they actually didn't need it to be as big as thought, and so removed the top few layers, or at the very least didn't construct them. Uh, so Fermi said, okay, we, we have this kind of value that he set where once we get to that, we are ready to go. And so he was able to stop it early, and the final dimensions of the partially completed sphere measured uh, 6.1 meters high by 1.8 meters wide, with a span of 7.6 meters across the middle contained 5.4 metric tons of uranium metal, 45 tons of uranium oxide, and 360 tons of graphite. And on December 2nd, 1942, the control rods were slowly removed and the reactor started its fission chain reaction. Due to a low trip limit, the experiment ended right before lunch, so they took a quick break for lunch, which Fermi suggested. They came back that afternoon, removed the control rods again, and the reactor became critical, running for about 4.5 minutes at 0 0.5 watts before an alarm rang and it was shut down. Now, mind you, at this point, it had no radiation protection aside from the layers of graphite and the, the rubber seal, which really isn't much for some forms of radiation. Um, so it was not the safest thing to operate. And further tests of the reactor would bring it from that 0 0.5 watts that it initially achieved to about 200 watts, or enough to power a light bulb at the time. The reactor was disassembled on February 28, 1943, and was actually used to produce the Chicago Pile 2, which would have better radio radiation protection measures. Now, despite its short run, CP1 
proved that a nuclear chain reaction could occur at a controlled rate, and that this information would later be used for the development of the atomic bomb, which would be first tested a few years later. This was also the first glimpse at how nuclear fission could be used for power generation, which is something that's still done today. And while controversial, nuclear fission reactors offer immense possibilities in energy production and research. However, as you know, fusion reactors are just around the corner, but they are being heavily researched and we're seeing more promising results, including net positive energy uh, from fusion reactors. So it's possible that the work that went into this might not be used for too much longer to produce power. And reactors that really truly started with the Chicago Pile 1 may not be needed in the future. Thank you, Patrick, for the story. And I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. See ya.